Well, welcome to this December 8th edition of Culturally Appropriate. We've got a great show for you today. First, we're going to talk to N. Pryor, who wrote a book earlier this spring called Parents of the World Unite, which I reviewed in yesterday's edition of The Pamphleteer. Then we're going to shift and talk about the new film Eileen, starring Thomas and McKenzie and Anne Hathaway. And as always, we will end our show with our weekly film rundown. So let's go ahead and get started. My first guest and only guest for today is N. Pryor, who is the author of a really great kind of hybrid memoir handbook for concerned parents um, in this day and age. So Ian, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Great. So I've read the book. Um, I've been recommending this book to people since I read it over the mm -hmm. summer. Um, you know, you've got you've got a very interesting story. Um, did you ever think that you would write a book whenever you first got into uh, law and politics? No, I, I mean, I, I never, ever thought I would write it. I mean, there was times when I was younger, we're like, oh, I'd, I'd love to write a novel or something, but I never thought that I would write a book based on certainly this topic. Um, but, you know, it was, it was an interesting exercise. It was, it was fun to do. And I think it was, you know, it was a hell of a story. Yeah. So what was it that motivated you to write this book about your experience over the course of pandemic era Loudoun County, Virginia? Uh, well, I think there was two things really. I mean, the, the first being that it really, like I said, it was a hell of a story. You brought together all of these these people that had never really been involved in in politics at all. Um, they weren't necessarily, you know, Republican, Democrat. It, it really wasn't that. Um, but they all sort of came together, and you had all these different personalities, all these different skill sets, uh, really towards this common goal. And it was right in the middle of, you know, really the biggest election in the country at the time, the Virginia governor's election. Um, which, you know, most people predicted that would be the only one that was competitive if it wasn't even, if it was even competitive. So it was just a, a really good story with a lot of different characters. And I think the second part is throughout this pushback on the Loudoun County School Board, the superintendent, you know, now our, or our former superintendent and now our former, former um, prosecutor. Uh, I heard a lot. I heard a lot of criticisms from our, um, our opponents on how Oh, this is all manufactured. This is dark money. This is, you know, they're using this as a test case for the midterms. Like it was all set up ahead of time or something. And so I thought, well, this is a good time to um, to set that record straight because that's that's not how it happened at all. Yeah, and I I love that idea of dark money because it just seems like that's the phrase du jour. So, um, could you tell our listeners, viewers, readers, whoever's experiencing uh, my discussion of the book and our conversation um, about your background before you wrote this book? Yeah. So I, you know, I started out as a, as a lawyer in New England um, for about 10 years, and then I transitioned over to, to politics and I ended up managing a congressional race uh, in, in Rhode Island in 2012. I've never done anything political before in my life. Uh, we weren't successful. I mean, it's Rhode Island. It was a, it was a tough district, but that ended me coming down to Washington, D.C., um, where I got a communications job at the National Republican Congressional Committee. So I did that for about two and a half years. Then I moved over to American Crossroads Senate Leadership Fund, which is a super PAC. And, you know, in the 2016 cycle, we're really focused on um, keep holding the Senate uh, during a presidential year. Uh, from there, I went over to the Department of Justice during the Trump administration, where I was in the public affairs division. Uh, and then I eventually, you know, sort of did my own thing public affairs wise. And, you know, everything was was going well. It was a, a comfortable living. And and this whole, you know, craziness in Loudoun County started. And I decided I was going to you know get myself into the mix. Yeah. And so one of the funniest responses to your book, I was going through the Amazon reviews. Um, you know, first of all, outside of certain circles, people are pretending this book doesn't exist. Um, I had a hard, was hard pressed to find, you know, legacy media reviewing your book. But one of the more funny things that I noticed is people on Amazon that were kind of obvious review bombing techniques that we're talking about how you know, your book is your book is a work of you know, political um it's polemical the fact that you work in politics means that you're not credible about writing about this issue so one thing that i wanted to do was set up for our readers like what life is like in loudon county virginia and what kind of demographics make up this community well you know it's it's so it's exurban, right? So I mean, there's sort of a tale of two Loudoun counties. You have sort of the eastern part of Loudoun County, which is much more like Fairfax County extended. You've got data centers. Um, you've got a lot of building going on, a lot of people moving in. Um, you have a lot of people moving from the you know DC, Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax that want to be 
you know, have a little bit more space. Um, and as a result, a, a county that was primarily, you know, conservative 10, 15 years ago it, is now becoming more and more left leaning. And then out in the western side, it's still really kind of traditional Loudoun County. It, it votes Republican. Um, but, you know, w- what what I saw certainly was that, you know, the, the left that um, that really became ascendant, I think, in Loudoun County in 2019. And I think the reason for that was was really, I mean, ridiculous. But I think that it was still an anti-Trump vote from the left, you know, two years after he took office in elections that had literally nothing to do with him. And so you end up with a a 7-2 Democrat majority on the school board. You end up with a Soros-backed, you know, horrific prosecutor um, in the, the county's most powerful position. And then you end up with a board of supervisors that's that's also, you know, a, a six three, I think at the time, um, left leaning majority. And and what they, you know, I think they thought that they had a mandate to to do whatever they want. None of these people ran on, hey, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna allow boys and girls bathrooms, or you know, we're gonna we're gonna teach all your kids that they're either oppressed or oppressors and to focus on microaggressions and all that. They didn't run on that, right? They ran on we want more lunches and we want more school buses and all that fun stuff. And then they get in there and they just really start bowing down to the special interests uh, in Loudoun County that, that really kind of ran the show. And that's, that's what, you know, that's what brought us to where we were. Right. So, I mean, would you say one of the, one of the really impressive things about the book is the way that you sort of set up your neighborhood. I feel like it's this, and I talk about it in my review, like, you know, I wouldn't expect this from a book that, almost seems like a political guide. You know, you've got a guidebook to helping parents, but the way that you capture just sort of these moments in time in this neighborhood is is really remarkable. Like I still laugh about the, uh, it almost seems like a movie scene as you talk about you know, in the book and you just mentioned that, you know, you're, you're talking to this person that's dressed as a koala about Brett Kavanaugh, which, I mean, I still think about that sometimes and just kind of chuckle because it's, it's so nice of an image to, uh, you know, really hit the satirical bent home. But your neighbors in this neighborhood, um, are they, do they mainly work in politics? Do a lot of them work in DC? Um, you know, some of them, uh, you know, that I reference are sort of local. They're, they're kind of involved in local politics. Others, not really. I think they, you know, they're, they're keyboard warriors, right? I mean, they go on Twitter, they go on Facebook and, you know, they believe whatever they read. They believe whatever they see on, on MSNBC. And they, they come in with preconceived notions. And a lot of these people, you know, some of them used to be Republicans and now they're done. It's like whatever the new thing is that's going to give them credibility. But ultimately, I think what you have with with these people is they're, they're searching for some kind of meaning in life. Right. And they, they look at at politics and you know the, the culture wars as their meaning. And they go to these extreme ends to 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 demand you know, not just that you listen to them, because that's fine, not not just that you debate them, but that you you bow down to their viewpoint and that there is no viewpoint other than their viewpoint. And if you don't have that, you're wrong. You must be canceled. You must be ostracized from society. And it's it's a strange thing to see with people that, you know, before I think COVID and before George Floyd, you know, I mean, you may have been sort of wary of certain people, but you, you never would have thought that they would they would engage in the, the kind of behavior that they engaged in. Yeah. So Virginia Green, I'm I've got a personal stake in this. I know I was uh, with our copy editor. We were just watching the Loudoun County returns in November when they came out and texting through Telegram. But I've got a kind of a personal stake in this because I am from Wise County, Virginia, which is on you know the other side of the state. And I was up there actually this weekend and it looks like October 2016 with all of the Trump banners that are up. And this is an area that when I grew up was Democratic stronghold as, as long as I can remember. Um, but there is, seems to be this budding resentment in the state of you know, sort of the D.C. influence creeping in and changing the demographics because there are so many people in the sort of outpost of Virginia where a lot of the you know, coal industry is and a lot of the money is coming from that, you know, I know whenever I was growing up, there was almost like a push to split the state into like a third Virginia, just because of the fact that things on that side of the state are so different and things on your side of the state, you know, really govern what happens to people in these Appalachian communities as well. So do you see, you mentioned there's sort of a divide in Loudoun County. Do you see something similar going on there that's going on in sort of this East versus West or East versus Southwest divide? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think like Northern Virginia has just, you know, an outsized influence on, on everything in Virginia from elections to population. I mean, it is a very different state in Northern Virginia than it is in the rest of Virginia. So, for example, like if you were to take, I don't know, say <coughs> Alexandria, Arlington, Fairfax, and then maybe take Montgomery County and some of the counties up in Maryland and then just just move them into D.C., right? Move them all into D.C. And it's like, you guys want to be a state. Okay, well, I guess you can be a state, get your two senators. And then you can have two Republican senators in Virginia. You're going to have two Republican senators in um, in Maryland because it's really a it's, it's this D.C. and D.C. suburbs are their own entity. And they sort of they encroach on these other states and they influence the, the elections of the other states. They don't really represent, I think, the, the values of, of the, those states overall. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a complicated thing, you know, every time, I mean, I remember watching and I wasn't really into state politics then I had just moved to Virginia, but in 2014, you know, not realizing you watching the returns from the governor's race, you're like, oh, Cuccinelli's going to win, Cuccinelli's going to win. But it's like, no, 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 they haven't counted Northern Virginia yet. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess Northern Virginia gets to make the call. And so that, that's really sort of the influence that, that it has on, on the state overall. Absolutely. And that's the most frustrating thing about any election season is that a sense of hope that comes out and then just gets crushed at the 11th hour every time a Virginia race is uh, is broadcast, I guess, which helps, too, since they're usually in those off years that it just makes things even worse. So um, right. a lot of our readers and a lot of our viewers might be familiar with what happened in, in Loudoun County, Virginia, and especially this sort of media coverage of it being like sort of the the nexus of what happened between Yunkin and Terry McAuliffe. But for those that weren't following the story between 2020 and 2021, can you walk our audience through some of the most sure. egregious experiences that you had with the school board and the now defeated DA? Yeah, I mean, I could go on forever. Uh, that's that's why I wrote the book. But, you know, it's funny because the book really cuts off before a lot of the, the things came to um, fruition. Uh, but, you know, it really starts, I mean, during COVID, right? Uh, you know, Loudoun County schools, just like everybody, every other sort of blue state was shut down. Parents were, were protesting the shutdowns. All right. You know, that's not solely on the school board for their management. Everybody was in a, a you know, a new time on how to deal with it. Um, but it's how they reacted to that. And so in March of 2021, you had this, this group of activists that included school board members that included our Commonwealth attorney, Soros Back, Buddha Bibarai. And what they wanted to do was, was start listing names of people that, that spoke out against the school board to, you know, cancel those people, right? To do opposition research, to send mail, to, to they even wanted to find hackers to, uh, you know, go to their websites and redirect them to new websites. And that really was sort of the, the match that lit everything. And that's what lit our, our removal petition. So we're like, there's six school board members in there. Don't care. I mean, they were all Democrat, but there was one that a Democrat that wasn't. But it's like it didn't matter. We were just going to go after the people that we thought were violating our rights, violating FOIA laws, violating the First Amendment. And, and it, it started to snowball. We started to you know pick up um, signatures left and right because that's really what you have to do. Um, but it didn't end there. I mean, that was really just the start of it. You know, in in June of or May of 2021, um, they put a teacher on suspension speaking at a school board meeting as a citizen of, of Loudoun County saying, look, you guys are going to pass a, um, a policy that's going to require me to you know, refer to kids by their preferred pronouns. I, I can't do that. You know, so I'm, I'm speaking out against this proposed policy. They suspended him. Of course, he won in court a couple of weeks later. As that was happening, there was a sexual assault in a bathroom at one of the high schools, which nobody really knew about. And, you know, it involved a kid. He was wearing a skirt. Um, there's lots of testimony that he considered himself gender fluid. You know, he met up with a girl in the bathroom, sexually assaulted her. And this all kind of happened right around the same time with the teacher getting suspended and the, the sexual assault as they were trying to pass this policy that said you can use the bathroom of whatever gender you express yourself, uh, express of yourself. And you have to you know, use the pronouns that are demanded of you by, you know, some 12 year old kid. Um, and so what happened was at this June 22nd meeting, one of the school board members asked our now former and criminally convicted superintendent, Scott Ziegler, um, you know, are there assaults in, in our bathrooms and locker rooms? He says, no, I'm not aware of any records of assaults in our, our bathrooms. Right. Well, that wasn't true. Um, as it turned out, they were aware. He had emailed the whole school board the day it happened, you know, a month earlier. And, you know, what happens next 
Uh, well, they moved the kid to another school. He's got an ankle bracelet on for the, the new year. Uh, and then he sexually assaults a, another student at another school. And that came out. And then everybody learned, oh, this is the same kid. The superintendent lied about it. The school board did nothing about it. Um, the, the Commonwealth prosecutor, you know, what was her role in this? And, you know, Youngkin and Jason Yarez, our now attorney general, said, look, we're going to investigate. And it became, you know, sort of this, this October moment that, you know, everyone talks about October surprises and these, these things, but this was, actually was one. And I think that Youngkin had been talking about parental rights for a while, um, but this really just, you know, gave him the opportunity to say, this is what we've been talking about. This is what the parents have been talking about. This is why I'm running. He wins. Jason Yarez wins as attorney general. Glenn Youngkin authorizes um, Jason Yarez to investigate Loudoun County Public Schools, uh, convenes a special grand jury. They come out with this scathing report on, on the school and the school board and what they did and how they tried to, you know, really just were dishonest during the entire special grand jury process, but they indicted the superintendent for, for a couple of things. And um, this past September, they tried him and he was convicted. So now I believe his sentencing is, is coming up. Um, but at the same time, all of those school board members either said, we're not running again, or the two that did run were defeated. Now, you know, it's unfortunate that we're still stuck with a, a 6-3 sort of Democrat endorsed majority um, but look, our goal all along was never about, you know, Republicans, Democrats. It's about cleaning out the people that were in there that, that enabled this. And, and probably the biggest win, I think, in Virginia um, that, that we had last month was, once again, Buddha Bibberai, our, our Commonwealth attorney, um, she was beaten. She was beat. She spent a million dollars and she was beaten by a 75 year old man who spent seventy thousand dollars and she lost by 300 votes. This is somebody that you know, associated with really the worst of the worst activists in Loudoun County, um, didn't want to prosecute misdemeanors, um, you know, was was arguably responsible for, um, you know, a criminal getting going back out um, on, you know, on probation and then committing a murder. Uh, and then she'd been kicked off like a bunch of cases for for just being overly political. So a big win in, in really the most powerful position in, in the county. So it's like we look back at all the things we did. You know, we started out. It's like, well, we want this school board gone. Then we realized, well, we want this superintendent gone. And then we want this Commonwealth attorney gone because, you know, all the things she's done, plus she did everything she could to stop our efforts to remove the school board. Well, they're all gone now. So would you say that the movement that happened was completely partisan? Um, was it just Republicans rising no. up? Or yeah. It definitely was. I mean, there are people... You know, we had Democrats in our group. We had independents, um, you know, we had libertarians. You know, I, I don't it definitely wasn't it wasn't related. It certainly wasn't you know, teed in with the, the local Republican Party that much. Sure, there were lots of Republicans and conservatives that were involved that made up sort of the lion's share. Um, but I think where we were able to be effective is that we were if this was not about Republican versus Democrat. Uh, this is about accountability and transparency and elected officials doing the right thing. Now, look, the left tried to make it that way, um, and maybe they were successful in doing that. Uh, but ultimately, we had the success in achieving the goals that, that we wanted to achieve. So even though the school board is majority Democrat by like a slight margin now, it is much more of a traditional Democrat than sort of this friendly. Well, we'll black. see. We'll see. You know, they they take office in January and we'll see if they've they've learned the lessons from you know, the last school board uh, and if they're going to govern more responsibly and, and focus on, you know, actual dollars and cents and, and making sure they have a, you know, a good school system as opposed to, you know, this this social experimentation club that, that the last school board really put in play. What would you say to people who actually believe that CRT is not being taught in these schools and this issue of pronouns and, and transgender rights is completely overblown? Uh, well, I, I, let's see. Let's, let's take those one at a time. As, as far as CRT, I mean, you know, look, they, they come up with all this stuff. They say, well, that's a law school class. Like, yeah, okay, no, what, no one's saying that they're teaching critical race theory 101 in, you know, a high school anywhere in America. But it's a system, right? It is a system of how you teach where, you know, it's constant grievance. You look for the oppression in every single thing, whether it's race, whether it's sex, whatever it is, right? 
Um, and and they, that's how they teach and that's how they train their teachers. And, you know, I, I, to those, I would say, OK, well, if you're going to say that, that there's no that there's no CRT in schools because it's not taught. Well, that's like saying there's no meritocracy in schools because nobody teaches a class on meritocracy. Right. But that is traditionally how we have implemented our educational system. Well, CRT is really the exact opposite of that. It's this is not about the best person. This is about dividing people and giving people preferences or giving people advantages, you know, based on the color of their skin, their their religion, whatever. Pick a category. Um, as far as the pronouns, I mean, look, nobody had ever heard of this 10 years ago. OK, except for the most far left ideologues. Mainstream America, you know, a boy and a girl sport. That's absurd. Right. Or you're going to you're going to transition a kid at school without telling their parents. That's that's absurd. Right. Boys are boys. Girls are girls. It's when you're born. That's when we find out. Doctor doesn't guess despite what they say. Right. So the idea that, you know, 40,000 years of human history tell us one thing. But, you know, we figured it out over the past 10 years and those 40,000 years of human history and biology, et cetera, they're all wrong. Let's go into this thing where there's no such thing as, you know, actual biological sex and gender, whatever it means, is fluid. I mean, it's absurd. It's dangerous. It's confusing for kids that are, that are growing up and that are you know, going through adolescence, going through puberty to have these these just insane ideas put in their head as if this is something that that's normal. And there is this sort of strange cognitive dissonance on the left where homeschools are bad because they don't teach socialization. But this idea of social contagion just can't happen at a school based on the policies, which is just baffling to me. And yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. You look at some of the maps, right, and you see clusters of it happening. You know, and this is not something that happened before. So, you know, I love these. I love the little uh, the charts where it says, you know, people that identify as as LGBTQ plus. Right. First of all, th there's several different groups in there. OK, so they, they like to group those together as if that they're all the same people with all the same interests. They're not. Um, but if you if you think about like transgender, you're like, well, there's G boomers. It's like down here. Gen X, it's down here. Millennials, it's like maybe over here. And then Gen Z, it's over here. And say, OK, well, that, that should show you it's a social contagion. They say, no, 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 no. That just shows that we're more accepting. Oh, it does. OK, so why aren't all those Gen X people that are like, you just haven't accepted me for all these years. Why aren't you seeing an uptick there? Because it's a social contagion. It's, it's simple. And that's something that we're sort of debating right now in Tennessee. Um, last week, Governor Lee released this voucher plan and there were all sorts of criticisms coming at it. Like this is a coupon for rich kids was one of them. But then also a tweet later, the same school board member or the same director of public schools would say that this is going to bankrupt the school system and utterly dismantle it. Um, how do you see this voucher issue that you know we're going to be really making the primary issue of our next legislative session related to the movement that you've started? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's funny when they say this is this is voucher for rich kids. Like, look, if they're that rich, like they're fine. OK, um, really, what this does is this helps everybody, especially low income families. Right. Because you get trapped in these schools. I mean, think about what's going on in Loudoun County right now. These schools having all these fentanyl overdoses. They're just poorly run, poorly managed. They're getting no support from administrations. You've got to send your kids to that school. You have no choice because you can't afford private school. Well, what about that family? Right. That family is stuck there. Now, if you have school choice, that family can say, you know what, I'm going to take that money and I'm going to go somewhere else. So what it does is it really traps people that, that don't have the money to send their kid to the school of their choice. As far as bankrupting the, the school system, I mean, come on. I look at I look at Loudoun County Public Schools. They got like a $1.6 million budget. They're paying their communications director like quarter of a million dollars to not communicate. I mean, really, it's going to bankrupt the school system. They want to pay $11 million to install unisex bathrooms at schools. Like, let's start with that first. Let's start with getting rid of all the wasteful spending that you all have. And then then you can come back and say, well, this is going to bankrupt the school system. Yeah, I think um, one of our one of our supporters put out a bunch of information about how many officials that are you know completely removed from the classroom in Nashville, just in the metro Nashville school system, are making close to 200 grand a year. And it's it's absolutely absurd, given <laughs> given the jobs that they do. So parents that are interested in this, they've heard about it, they might not know a lot about what's going on in their schools. 
based on your experience, what are the three top concerns that they should have about their kids and the education they're getting in public schools at this moment? Um, well, you know, I, I think on the transgender issue, it's it's got multiple levels, right? I mean, if you're the parent of a of a girl that's an athlete and you've got boys playing girls sports, I mean, that's a safety risk. It's a competitive risk, too. And it's just simply not fair. Um, the, the parental consent issue. Look, kids are impressionable, right? They're on TikTok. They're on Instagram. They're they're on the Internet. They're seeing all these things, these influencers. And they go to school and the school says, look, if you want to be a boy, we won't tell your parents. You can be a boy here. We'll call it. We'll call Judy. We'll call you Johnny here. When you go home, you can still be you can still be Judy. And we'll we'll make sure we refer to you as Judy when we talk to the parents. That's insane. That is the government interfering with the parent child relationship. Um, so, you know, and then the bathroom issue, I would say, is also a similar bathroom and locker rooms. Right. It's a safety issue. It's a it's a privacy issue. Um, and it it's just, you know, we've separated uh, facilities on the basis of biological sex for as long as we've had facilities and humans. And again, it's oh, in just 10 years, we've evolved to this, you know, super oh enlightened thought. So like that is that is very concerning um, on the on the CRT stuff. I mean, I think you're seeing the the end game of of this kind of teaching, the oppressor versus the oppressed narrative playing out in the Israel Hamas conflict. I mean, you're looking at all these these, I mean, quite frankly, brats in college that are sitting there supporting Hamas. Right. I mean, they're supporting Hamas. So they'll say, well, we're supporting the Palestinian people. No, no, no. You were supporting an organization that launched a terrorist attack, a brutal terrorist attack on a country that occupies a sliver of the Middle East based on they've taken our land. Like, look at the rest of the Middle East. It's 99 percent Arab. But they're like, well, we're oppressed. Right. So they just make that decision. They have no idea about the history of the region. They have no idea about the history of Palestine, which, of course, Palestine, Syria, Palestine is a Roman province. It's not some you know ancient um, you know, group of people that have been there forever. And, and they just go out and they say these things. And then these same people, these same people that, that are doing this now on college campuses or in high schools. Right. They're the ones saying, oh, you conservatives, uh, you're Nazis. Like, I'm sorry. I, I, the, the, it just makes no sense. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about there seems to be this this groundswell, this sort of pushback finally that we're seeing in the media with you know donors pulling um, their money from various schools and you know Hollywood actually canceling people um, and refusing to represent them anymore, or firing them from movies. And we're we're in that sort of it seems like there's like a victory for people that are doing the work that you're kind of doing. Um, but there was a lot of ink spilled right after the midterm elections about how, by and large, a lot of school boards didn't make that turn. And you said that you know, the same thing kind of happened in in Loudoun County. Um, do you agree with the assessment that you know the media really pushing this idea of banned books and some of the more fringe elements or you know demonizing the kind of work that you're doing? had sway with moderate voters um at all um i think on some level i i think there are some things that that are effective and some things that aren't you know the, the pushback on on critical race theory you know issues was well, they don't want to teach accurate history like you know i don't really think that, that too many people bought that um because a lot of people see it in their day-to-day -day lives right i mean they see affirmative action they see having to go through these employee trainings. And I'm like, yeah, that's crazy. Like we were doing that at school too. Uh, the books is a more complicated issue and they did get, you know, that narrative out there. Like they want to ban books, right? And it's a, it's a very nuanced issue because one, okay, obviously we're talking about government purchased books that are made available by the government. That's, that's government sponsored books, okay? But two, there wasn't like the appropriate, I think, pushback. Um, and, and how I'd, I'd frame it is this. I saw Hakeem Jeffries, on the House floor, I think in October, talking about how Republicans want to ban books and, you know, they don't want to teach kids about the Holocaust. It's like, OK, so let me just go into Loudoun County Public Schools library. And, you know, you've got uh, 40 books available countywide on this one kid who's trans and you got 30 books on another kid who's trans. And you got 50 books on another kid that's trans. OK, all right, well, let's do lot Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. How many how many copies of Rise and Fall of the Third Reich are in Loudoun County Public Schools library? Zero. How many copies of Roots? Three. Right. Like this, they, they are they are gaslighting people, and people are falling for it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people will say, like, 
oh, you're one of those people that wants to ban books. Like who's banning books? Banning books is saying you can't publish the book. Banning books is saying you can't sell the book. Right. And uh, look, I think there's there's reasonable compromises too. I, you know, if you want to have these these crazy books in your school, all right, put them put them in a section that requires parental permission to access, right? And that are not available to the general public, right? Just to walk through the library and say, yeah, I want that book about, you know, how to become transgender. All right, put it behind the wall, like in Blockbuster. And if a parent wants their kid to take it out, fine. They need to sign a permission slip. The end, right? There's a lot of different ways to do that. And I think that that people would be smart um, to really look at those ways to, I don't want to say compromise, but offer positions that the average person would say, you know what, that actually makes sense. And then make them defend the most radical positions. Always position the other side into a spot where they have to be the one defending their radical positions, not where you're the one defending, you know, your common sense positions. And I think that's something going forward that, that you know, this movement needs to be cognizant of. Um, you know, for example, I would say like the bathrooms, right? So in the Fourth Circuit, We've got a case called um, Grimm versus Gloucester County, right? So the 11th Circuit uh, Court of Appeals, Federal Court of Appeals says, no, um, Title IX means biological sex. Schools can uh, segregate bathrooms based on biological sex. In the Fourth Circuit, which is Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, West Virginia, Maryland, they say, well, this one case in this one county where this kid, you know, got a doctor's diagnosis, his mom was involved, et cetera was allowed to have the accommodation of using a different bathroom. Okay, understood. I don't agree with that at all, but that unfortunately is the law in this circuit until a higher court decides differently. Well, what's happened is that all these, these counties, these, these woke counties say, all right, great. We're going to um, create these policies where you can use whatever bathroom or locker room of the gender you identify with. You don't need to present a doctor's note. Your parents don't need to be involved. You don't have to go through any processes. Well, that's not what the case said. That is not what the case said. So I think in some of these more, um, you know, in these in these places in the Fourth Circuit where, you know, you have to comply with, with the federal law, understand what the federal law is and, and stick to the confines of that law and go no further. Or if you want, I mean, I the better option would be to just say, no, and have someone challenge you and work your way up to the Supreme Court. Um, but I think, you know, in places like Fairfax County and Loudoun County, that becomes extremely difficult. Uh, but I, I think people need to research what the actual law is. They just believe these talking points that come from people. And, and you know, it's just, it's not accurate. And you, know, you just really illustrated one of my favorite parts of the book, which is you have a, you have a knack for explaining policy and law um, in a way that's really accessible to people who aren't in your field. So, I wanted to commend you on that, but I also mm -hmm. wanted to ask you, I don't want to spoil the book. I don't want you to the list your 12 rules on the show because I want people to read it. But if you could give one piece of advice to parents who have been inspired by what you're doing, what would that be? Um, yeah, and it's funny because the the one piece of advice, I don't even think I really put in the book. Maybe I did. I, I can't remember. But I always go back to that movie, The Untouchables, which I'm sure was dramatized and, and whatnot. Um, but the key in that fight of Elliot Ness versus Al Capone, it's like Elliot Ness didn't get Al Capone on murder. Elliot Ness didn't get Al Capone on bootlegging. Elliot Ness got Al Capone on tax evasion, right? And and that's that's where people need to go. It's you're not going to necessarily get you know success just by going after the policies themselves. You're going to have success by showing how these school districts and how these bureaucrats in the administration and on the school board level, break the rules in order to pass these policies because they're doing it. They are doing it, whether they're violating Freedom of Information Act, whether they're violating the law, it's get them breaking the rules because they'll do it, they'll do it over and over again until they're challenged. And once you challenge them, well, they'll, they'll continue doing it. And then you sort of encircle them and you're like, all right, well, now you're trapped and you're not gonna be around anymore. Great. Well, Ian, thank you so much for talking to us today. Uh, again, the book is Parents of the World Unite. I would highly recommend it as a holiday present. I'd highly recommend it as a, a, a great holiday read. Um, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more from you soon. Can you really quickly give a plug for the organization that you started so we can uh, get our... Yeah, so I started Fight for Schools, um, but that was sort of a defined mission uh, that was really focused on Loudoun County. But I also, I work at America First Legal which is we are taking, you know, we are taking action, whether it's, um, you know, 
affirmative action, woke corporations, or whether it's a school. We have several cases against schools for the very things that we talked about. Um, and, you know, we're a public interest law firm. So, you know, we represent clients. We don't charge them for it because our, our mission is to, you know, make America the kind of place that it's supposed to be, that adheres to the Constitution, that respects people's rights. Um, so I would encourage everyone to follow along with what we're doing. Great. And no, you're on you're on Twitter X, whatever it's called. Um, you're on the web. We'll put some of the, the information up in our show notes as well. So Ian, thanks so much again for joining us and have a wonderful holiday. Thanks, you too. All right. So that was Ian Pryor with his uh, newish book, Parents of the World Unite. So next we're going to move on to one of my favorite films of the year, which got its release this week. Um, in a couple of theaters around town, it's playing at AMC Thoroughbred, it's playing at Regal Opry Mills, and it's playing at Regal Green Hill 16. And that movie is William Oldroy's Eileen. Uh, it's a movie that stars Thomason McKenzie and Anne Hathaway. And as you know, if you watch this program, we're large proponents of regionalism in film, of regional stories, stories that just don't take place in elite circles. And Eileen is one of those films. At times, it takes somebody that is an outsider to really get what's going on in America. And one of the greatest strengths about the movie Eileen is the fact that it is set in a place that we don't really see much in American popular culture. And that is the area that's outside of Boston, small town Massachusetts, not idyllic hallmark Massachusetts, but small town Massachusetts, a prison town, if you will. And that's who the movie focuses on, a prison secretary Eileen, played by Thomas and McKenzie, who is isolated in her life. She has a father that's falling deep into alcoholism who used to be a police officer. She lives alone. She takes care of him. She takes his verbal abuse every single day. She's utterly isolated in her job, and she doesn't have anywhere to turn. And suddenly, Anne Hathaway's Harvard-educated prison psychologist, Rebecca, comes into town. And Rebecca is, if you will, kind of the new woman, the liberated woman. She comes in in a red sports car. She comes in in fancy clothes. And she takes a liking to Eileen. They, they, they stoke up a friendship. Um, a lot of critics, when this movie first came out, after its premiere at Sundance, talked about this movie as an LGBTQ film. Um, it's a movie that really is more about desire and more about regionalism and the conflicts that happen between regions in certain states, as, as Mr. Pryor just talked to us about. The idea that we have this version of Virginia over here and this version of Virginia in the Southwest and how that, in this case, translates to New England. Uh, that's really what the movie is about. Um, one of the other major strengths of the movie is that it is a genre film. So this is a film that starts out as a character study. It plays through the different genre tropes of this thriller. It builds tension. And I'm not going to spoil the ending for anybody, but it really kind of explodes toward the end in this in this really amazing way. I had a chance to see this movie at the Nashville Film Festival back in October, and I'm so glad that it came out. If you haven't seen Oldroyd's other movie, which is Lady Macbeth, it's the movie that sort of had Florence Pugh. It was her breakout film, um, and it's not a Shakespeare adaptation, but it is a movie about uh, a wife who has an, an abusive husband and how she sort of protects her place in his family. Really great film. Um, Old Roy is a filmmaker that really needs to be discovered. He needs to be talked about in ways that really, really, even though he's had these nice prestigious projects, hasn't really. I don't expect Eileen to really be a contender in the Oscar race because I think it's a little bit too complicated for that. Um, the movie works at multiple levels and it doesn't sort of hit those buttons directly that generate into Oscar buzz, but it is one of the best films of the year. I don't know if it's going to be my number one of the year just quite yet, but it is definitely up there. Um, one of my favorite scenes is just something so, so small. Thomas and McKenzie gives an amazing performance in this movie, as does Anne Hathaway. But there's a scene where Anne Hathaway invites her to Christmas Eve dinner, and she's just really nervous, and she's never really been in this kind of social situation before. And she goes to the restroom um, to kind of get a little bit of a breather, and she just kind of looks in there and makes this this face. She, like, grabs her face and starts, like, making faces like a child. And... It seems like such a throwaway moment, but it really does sort of get at the heart of Eileen's conflict in this movie. And just one of the most brilliant scenes that I've seen in a movie in quite some time. So if you get a chance to go out to AMC Thoroughbred or Regal Green Hills 
or Opry Mills this weekend, I would highly recommend you check out Eileen. In addition to it being a, you know, a really meaty, nuanced movie, it's got some gorgeous cinematography. If you've seen Todd Haynes' Carol, it's in that vein. Um, but just an absolutely masterful film that you should devote your time to, which leads us to this week's weekly film rundown. Obviously, Eileen is my top pick of the week. Um, I would recommend everybody see this movie, but we also have a lot. This is typically not a large box office week because we're getting into the Christmas movies next week with Wonka. So a lot of the bigger Thanksgiving movies are kind of getting their, their second win this week before moving into the holiday season. So it's kind of a nice fruitful time for smaller movies to get some air, like the shift from last week or Eileen. Um, what the Belcourt is doing, which I am deeply appreciative of is they're showing a lot of the big awards contenders that Netflix has made on the big screen for exclusive engagements. Over Thanksgiving weekend, they showed Todd Haynes's May December with Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore. And this week they are showing Bradley Cooper's Maestro, which is his biopic of Leonard Bernstein, the composer, um, that also stars Carey Mulligan as his wife. This movie has been getting rave reviews. There's been a lot of jokes about Bradley Cooper's nose in the movie and anti-Semitism before we actually had to start, you know, actually dealing with anti-Semitism and culture back in October. But by all accounts, this movie is on par with The Star is Born. Um, I don't know if you love or hate that movie. I personally thought it was amazing. So I'm guessing this is going to be one of our major Oscar contenders. And you know, just look at it in this trailer. This is not a movie that you should watch in your pajamas on Netflix. It's a movie that begs to be seen on a big screen. So we're really thankful to Belcourt is offering that opportunity to Nashvilleians this weekend. One of the other really awesome things that's happening this weekend and something I'm definitely making time for, um, Die Hard, the Christmas classic that everybody likes to debate, whether it's a Christmas movie or not, is going to be showing again nationwide, but at AMC Thoroughbred 20 and AMC Stones River 9 in Murfreesboro, it is showing in Dolby. Now, even the people that saw Die Hard in a theater, those fortunate few um, boomers and Gen Xers, they got to see it in a theater, didn't get to see it like it's going to be screening at those two theaters. So you know, amplified sound, seats shaking, massive screen. I can't think of a better way to experience Die Hard. Um, you know, this is a movie that really shouldn't be background noise at Christmas time. It's a movie that really demands that you sit down and watch it. One of the most impeccable screenplays ever written. A lot of people wonder why action movies are never as good as Die Hard. And one of the reasons is that if you think about Die Hard and think about the way that the plot unfolds, you know exactly how many people that John McClane has to get through in order to achieve his goal. So the action is clear. The motivation is clear. It's a brass tacks movie, and it uses that wonderful foundation to build on its broader themes about police, about relationships. So you know, a class act of a movie that really, really, really deserves to be seen on a Dolby screen. But this isn't the only classic Hollywood film that we're going to be able to see in theaters this week. There's also a re-release of Love Actually. Believe it or not, Love Actually is 20 years old. And this is another one of those movies that people get a lot of mileage on the internet. Is Love Actually problematic? Is it the best movie or the worst movie? I personally love the movie. I saw it in theaters when it first came out 20 years ago, when I was much, much younger, obviously. Um, I think it's a wonderfully written screenplay. It's got a lot of heart. Um, yeah, it is a little cloying, but it also has a nice little undercurrent uh, as well. So it's a little bit edgy. Um, I think this would be a great movie also to see in theaters uncut by commercials. So that's another one of your options. And AMC Murfreesboro 16 and AMC Thoroughbred 20 are also bringing back some other holiday classics, including 2003's bigger Christmas movie, Elf. Um, you know, James Caan is probably the best in this movie that he's been since The Godfather. So you know, why would you not want to go see Elf on the big screen? Um, they're also bringing The Polar Express, which is a movie that just creeps me out. Um, if you want to know why Gen Z is having so many social problems, just look at the fact that they love this weird Tom Hanks, this uncanny Tom Hanks in this movie. Um, probably the most terrifying image that I've ever seen on screen is CGI Tom Hanks in the Polar Express. So I'll be avoiding that at all costs. A little more known gem that the Belcourt is offering is Jimmy Stewart's The Shop Around the Corner with Margaret Sullivan. Uh, this is a movie made by Ernst Lubitsch, the famous classical Hollywood director, and it's the basis for the film You've Got Mail, if you've seen that movie in the past. Um, and it focuses on two leather goods employees in Budapest who are Starcrest lovers. Excellent script. Amazing. You know, they don't make these movies like they used to. And if you see Shop Around the Corner, you'll really notice that. 
Um, so those are our main picks for this week on the rundown. There are also a few other movies coming out, like the horror movie, The Cello. There's some really nice Bollywood, Tollywood offerings that are coming out as well. Uh, the Cello, I don't know what to think about it. It's by Saw director Darian Lynn Bowsman. Jeremy Irons is in it. The Cello is described as insidious in the press materials. I don't know exactly what that means, but... It might be if you've kind of caught up on your movies for the week and want a nice throwback if you've seen Thanksgiving multiple times uh, and you want to see a new horror movie. This one looks good enough. Um, Tobin Bell from Saw is also in it. So that really is a nice survey of what's opening in Nashville this week. I think there are 12 total movies coming out um, of varying quality. So if you want to look at some of the other stuff that's coming out this week, our full rundown is available on the Pamphleteers website. And that is our show for December 8th. So whatever you do this weekend, give it some thought. I hope you're having a wonderful Christmas season and I'll see you next week.